Good evening, everyone. Great to see you back tonight. Thank you for returning as we continue our study in the book of Revelation. Tonight we are in chapter 4, looking at the heavenly throne. You'll note in your handout, it says the book of Revelation is a book of the throne. The word throne appears 45 times in the book of Revelation. This is significant in light of the fact that the word appears only 15 times throughout the rest of the New Testament. It appears 17 times in chapters 4 and 5 alone. The throne represents the universal sovereignty or rulership of God. God reigns throughout the entire universe, not just upon the earth. So the key verse, Revelation 4, 2. At once I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. So our theme tonight is God sits on a magnificent throne, surrounded by attendants and worshipers, for he alone is worthy of such worship and rule. <clears throat> so we look at John's entrance into the throne room of God. John was given entrance into heaven. It says in verse 1 that as this, I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven. Uh, so there was an entrance, there was a doorway, there was a way for him to come into the presence of God. And John is invited to enter heaven. He said, after this, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice, which I heard speaking to me like a trumpet, said, come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. I have here that this is similar to the invitation that Moses received to come up on the mount and talk with God in Exodus 24, 1. Then he said to Moses, come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 elders of Israel, and worship from afar. John is not only invited into the throne room, but John is invited to look into the future. For it says, after this, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice, which I heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. And D, in heaven, what John sees is the throne of God. God's throne is the central figure to the coming events that John is to see. For it says, At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in the heaven, and one seated on the throne. It is because God is on the throne, sovereign, that the future is not only knowable, but certain. He said that these things must take place. They are irrevocable. Uh, they are indeed going to be accomplished, and it's because God is on his throne that these things are indeed certain, which stands in direct contrast to some of our theologies today. One of them is open theism, and that aspect is that God uh, not only does not control the future, he doesn't even know the future. He gives his best guess at what is going to happen, because mankind is given ultimate freedom, uh, and if that is freedom is true, uh, then uh, not even God knows what man is going to choose. Uh, so uh, he's in a chess game trying to achieve his purposes, hoping that he can outwit those that are opposing. But these things are certain because God indeed is on his throne. So number three, a description of the throne and the one sitting upon the throne. It's given to us, verse three. And he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. It should be noted that, first of all, we have a series of similes in this verse. It tells us in verse 3 that, uh, I'll read it from the NAS, and he was sitting, was like a jasper stone and a sardis in appearance, and there was a rainbow around the throne like an emerald in appearance. We find that there are many, many similes that are found in the uh, book of Revelation. It's important to understand them as a literary uh, tool. If you remember, a simile is a comparison using like or as. A metaphor is a comparison without using like or as. So there are both similes and metaphors in the scripture. So there's a lot of descriptive terms in the book of Revelation which are not to be taken literally. Uh, they are indeed uh, similes. They're comparisons. Uh, they're the best way that we can describe 
uh, in our understanding of what is taking place, but we need to understand that they are comparisons. So, number one, it does not mean that the one who sat on the throne was a stone. Nor does it mean that the one who sat upon the throne was stone-like. What it does mean is that the one who sat upon the throne had something in common with jasper and sardis stone. I've here perhaps the next phrase in the verse will help us to understand that significance. So, B, there was a rainbow that encircled the throne. Around the throne was a rainbow. We are first introduced to the rainbow in Genesis chapter 9, verse 13, where it says, I have set my bow. This is, of course, in response to the flood. Uh, and uh, this is the uh, Noahic covenant was established with God and with Noah and mankind and with the animals and with all of the earth said, I have set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth, and one bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you, and every living creature of all flesh, and the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. So number two, the rainbow represented God's covenant that he had made with the earth. Thus the rainbow is to serve as a reminder of God's grace and that he will not destroy the entire earth. Thus John sees, sitting upon the throne, a covenant-keeping God. Uh, this, uh, we're going to see the plagues that are going to come. We're going to see the judgments, the bold judgments, etc. Uh, but behind all those judgments, we find a covenant-keeping God uh, his sitting on the throne uh, with a reminder of his promises. That's why all these things are indeed certain going to come to pass, because God keeps his word. God is faithful. And there is a declaration of that faithfulness, even in the visual realm of this, co of this rainbow covenant that engulfs the throne. Number four, a description of the 24 elders around the throne. We note the, the righteousness of these elders. It says, around the throne was 24 thrones, Seated on thrones were 24 elders, clothed in white garments. Elsewhere in the book of Revelation, the white garments are viewed as symbols of righteousness. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these, clothed in white robes, and where do they come from? I said to him, Sir, you know. He said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. So they are protected. They are guarded by the one that sits on the throne. To note, however, that they are made righteous by the blood of the crucified lamb. I said to him, sir, you know, he said to me, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. So their righteousness is not their own, but it's a righteousness that's given to them by the blood of Christ. And of course, uh, next week we will look at chapter 5, and we see the Lamb in association with the throne next week. B, next we note the relative permanence of these elders round about the throne. They, there were thrones for them. They were seated on uh, 24 thrones. Uh, for the 24 elders, thus the elders were subordinate rulers to the one who was on the throne. So that we have this huge, magnificent throne of which sits the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And then surrounding that throne are 24 lesser thrones occupied by the 24 elders. Two, thus these elders were subordinate rulers to the one who is on the throne. They are in some capacity ruling under the authority of the um, one who sits on the great throne, namely God. Number three, the possibility has already been revealed that the apostles would sit on thrones and reign, Luke 22, 29. And I assign to you as my father assigned to me a kingdom that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones 
judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Now that ultimate kingdom is yet to be established. Uh, that ultimate kingdom is, is going to come in the period of the millennium, the thousand years in which Christ reigns on the earth. And then following that, there's going to be a new heaven and new earth in which uh, we as God's people reign with him. But just as Christ is in heaven and uh, that kingdom uh, is waiting to be fully established and is partially established now, for it tells us in Hebrews that all things are put under him, yet we do not yet see all things put under him. But he, as he sits and waits, if you will, and uh, rules, uh, so too these thrones are there, they're established, set up, and uh, that complete rule uh, is still yet future, but nonetheless uh, it's real and it's uh, present. C, the crowns that are described are then in essence a sign of rulership, a kingly crown. Around the throne were 24 thrones and seated on the thrones were 24 elders clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. I have here, perhaps this is helpful in understanding the crowns that will be given to us. 2 Timothy 4, 8. Hence therefore is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord the righteous judge will give me on that day and not to me only but unto all them that also love is appearing. 1 Peter 5, 4, when the chief shepherd appears, we will receive an unfading crown of glory. Um, Timothy also says that if we suffer with him, we shall also reign with him. So uh, perhaps this is the way in which we ought to understand these crowns that are going to be given to us. Uh, they are not just symbolic in terms of a reward, but there is a significance to these, these crowns that are going to be given to us. Certainly in the parables, we read how uh, some are going to reign over ten cities, and some are going to reign over five cities. Some are going to reign over one city. Uh, so I uh, would think that there is some literal nature to these things, and that uh, as part of this rule, there's going to be various jurisdictions. Uh, there's going to be levels of, of authority, if you will. Uh, and so here's the upper echelon of these uh, 24 thrones, 24 elders. D, the identification of the 24 elders. Their identification cannot be made with absolute certainty, for the Bible does not explicitly identify them. There's no place that uh, says who these 24 elders are. However, we do know that Jesus promised the apostles that they would be seated on thrones. This is also consistent with the apostles' role in the rest of the book of Revelation. Revelation 18.20. Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you saints and apostles and prophets, for God has given judgment for you against her. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were 12 names of the 12 apostles. So the 12 apostles play a prominent role in the book of Revelation, and it does tell us that uh, they are going to sit on thrones and judge the 12 tribes of Israel. So it's likely that... Twelve of those 24 elders are apostles. Three, there's also a common linking of the apostles with the prophets of the Old Testament. Revelation 18:20. Uh, Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you saints, and apostles, and prophets. For God has given judgment for you against her. Ephesians 2, 19 and 20. So then, you're no longer strangers and aliens, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus being the chief cornerstone. Uh, so I would submit to you that it's likely that these 24 elders are comprised of the 12 apostles and 12 Old Testament prophets, or leaders, if you will. A, to try to identify the 12 individuals that this might be seems to me to be futile. It does seem reasonable to assume that they are 12 Old Testament Testament saints. Uh, what is noteworthy is that they are 24 elders that occupy an exalted position around the throne and that these uh, 24 elders rule together. Uh, so it brings the Old Testament and New Testament together. Uh, as I say, we could talk about these prophets, but uh, don't see a lot of value in that. Number five. 
God speaks from the throne. Uh, these uh, sounds that we hear uh, are God's speaking to mankind, Revelation 4 or 5. From the throne, and uh, notice that these uh, are coming from the throne, all right? Uh, from the throne, not surrounding it, but from the throne itself, came flashings of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And King James says, and out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. <coughs> uh, voices is, is, uh, an act, is, a, is an interpretation of what these peals are. Uh, literally, it is peals. King James makes it voices. And I believe that there is good grounds for thinking that indeed the, these are voices for when God would speak, they, uh, his uh, voice would often be uh, understood uh, by uh, thunders and lightnings, etc. For example, number one, uh, while God, when God speaks, his voice is often like thunder, illustrating the life of Jesus. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that stood there heard it and said that it thundered. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. So they, the crowd didn't understand the voice. They knew that something really unusual was here. God spoke, but it was to them like, like thunder. Illustrated in Paul's experience on the road to Damascus. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. Uh, but we find out that when it says they heard a voice, it was not a discernible voice to them. Uh, when God spoke to uh, Paul and said, uh, Saul, Saul, why are you kicking against the uh, goads? Why are you persecuting me? They heard the sound, but to them it was undiscernible. Acts 22, 7, 8, and 9. And I fell into the ground and heard a voice saying unto me, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? I answered, Who art thou, Lord? He said unto me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou hast persecuted. And when they were with me, saw indeed the light and were afraid, but they heard not, did not understand the voice of him that spoke to me. Right? So they didn't understand the voice, but they heard this thundering. Illustrated in the Mount Sinai experience. Hebrews 12 says, For you are not come unto the mount that might be touched and that burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, which voice they had heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them anymore, for they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so, much as a beast touched the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. Exodus says, on the morning of the third day there was thunders and lightnings and a, click, a thick cloud. So when it says they heard the voice in Hebrews, it was not a discernible voice to them in Exodus. It was like thunder. It was like, like uh, <clears throat> lightning. They saw the thick cloud which represented the presence of God. So I'm just saying to you there is ample illustrations in the scripture that uh, these sounds that are coming from the throne are indeed God speaking. And uh, so God is going to be telling us as to what is going to happen in uh, the future. Uh, six, the majestic throne and its attendants. The theme is, the throne is majestic. Before the throne there was, as it were, again, a simile a sea of glass-like crystal. So there's two similes there. One, the, it was like the sea, it wasn't sea, and it was like grass that was crystal, and it wasn't glass, and it wasn't crystal, but it's like that, okay? Um, beautiful, magnificent, incredible. Nothing like ever seen on earth. 
different. The throne is attended by heavenly creatures. And before the throne, there was, as it were, a sea of glass, like crystal, and around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature, like a lion, the second living creature, like an ox, the third living creature, like the face of a man, and the fourth living creature, like an angel, in flight. The four living creatures are filled with knowledge and wisdom. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around them. And day and night, they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is to come. Now this portion is similar to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1, in the year of King Uzziah, died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. The train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. <clears throat> Number two, the throne and the surrounding attendants were testimonial to the magnificence of a king and his kingdom. So as we look at 1 Kings, uh, we have a depiction of the Queen of Sheba coming to speak with Solomon. And if you remember, Solomon had made for him a throne like no one had ever seen before. It was a, uh, a throne made out of ivory, uh, and then uh, it was covered with pure gold, and then he made uh, lions to sit on the other side, and there were steps leaning up to uh, the throne, and there were uh, these uh, gold and uh, lions that uh, sat there in an ornate fashion on each step that went up to that throne. And it says this in 1 Kings 10.4, When the Queen of Sheba had seen all the wisdom of Solomon, the house that he had built, the food of his table, the seating of his officials, and the attendance of his servants. And I think that is, is part of this very uh, significant aspect. Uh, she saw the seating of the officials. That corresponds to his 24 elders. And the attendance of his servants, uh, the way in which uh, Solomon's servants were decked out, the way in which uh, Solomon's servants attended him, uh, all of this pointed to his wisdom, all this pointed to his power, all of this pointed to the fact that this king was, was unique. And so what we are to see here is that the attendants that are around this throne are like no other attendants. They are like no other guards. <laughs> uh, they are, uh, you know, the Navy SEALs on steroids. Uh, the, these are just incredible attendants that are at the beck and call uh, of the one who sits on the throne. I think that's the, the bottom line to this. These are just incredible manifestations of the glory and the power of the one who sits on that throne. And just like the Queen of Sheba says, I've never seen anything like it. The, you know, the Apostle John that's in heaven, never seen anything like it. There's just nothing to be compared with this throne, the one who sits on it, the officials that are surrounded, and these attendants that uh, do the bidding and uh, serve the king. Number three, such a king is worthy of praise and gifts. First Kings chapter 10, verse 8. This is the uh, statement of the Queen of Sheba after she had seen all that uh, Solomon had uh, been able to accomplish. Happy are your men. Happy are your servants who continually stand before you and hear your wisdom. Blessed be the Lord your God who is delighted in you and set you on the throne of Israel because the Lord loved Israel forever. He has made you king that you may execute justice and righteousness. Then she gave the king 120 talents of gold and a very great quantity of spices and precious stones. Never again came such an abundance of spices as these that the Queen of Sheba had, uh, gave to King Solomon. And I would submit to you in like manner, uh, we're going to see the response that we should have uh, seeing this magnificence 
of the throne and the attendants. So number seven, the continuous worship of the creatures round about the throne. And the living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes within, and day and night they never cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is to come. So there is this never ending worship of God. Three aspects of God's person and rule are acknowledged. First is holiness. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord uh, God. Secondly, his power. He is almighty. Uh, You've heard the adage, power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts absolutely, but not in the case of God. He has absolute power, but he rules in righteousness and holiness. Uh, He is a good God. Uh, But that is really unique to uh, Christianity. Uh, Most uh, religions have a multitude of gods. Uh, They have uh, shared uh, domains. Uh, Some rule over uh, certain areas. Some rule over certain aspects of life. Fire gods or fertility gods or gods of rain or gods of this or gods of that. But what is unique, and when we talk about a sovereign God, is that he is God and there are no others. That he is God and he rules over all things, over all entities, in all places. Uh, He and he alone is God. And then his eternality, who was and is and is to come. So he is the eternal God. The form of the worship of the 24 elders, Revelation 4, 9, and 10. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, so number one, the elders do obeisance before the, the king. They, they fall down before him. They recognize his authority. And they uh, submit to him fully. Number two, the elders acknowledge God's worthiness. They, they worship him. And the elders submit all that they have and are to God. They cast their thrones their crowns before the throne. So they are submitting to his rule. They recognize that they rule under him. Uh, They are indeed doing his bidding as opposed to uh, doing their own thing. Uh, You know, in the church, uh, we have elders. uh, Pastors are among that group of elders. Uh, There is a chief elder. There's a chief shepherd. We know in in, uh, Ephesians that uh, Christ is the head of the church. But we don't always see people submitting to Christ's authority in this this day. Uh, We don't always see people ruling in the way in which God would have us to rule. Uh, We don't always exercise authority in the way in which that authority is to be exercised. But not so here. Uh, When we see the throne of God and the elders around about it, they are completely submissive to and subject their own authority to that of the king by even casting their crowns before him. And so the great prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth even as it is in heaven. Uh, This will of God going to be completely, absolutely fulfilled and followed illustrated in the 24 elders. See, the 24 elders pronounce the appropriateness of worshiping God. It's appropriate to worship God. Worthy are you, O Lord. Uh, they, uh, they do this willingly and gladly. In the worship of God, it's appropriate to ascribe three adorations. Uh, to receive glory, to receive honor, Revelation 4.11, worthy are you, O Lord, our God, to receive glory and honor. We give honor to God by reserving all of our worship for him and him alone. And uh, he is to receive power. Worthy are Lord, our God, to receive glory and honor and power. Uh, 
All these things belong unto you. Uh, and of course they manifest that by casting their crowns before him. Then the reasons that it's appropriate to worship God. For all things belong to God and owe their existence to God. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. Reason number one, for you created all things. Um, everything that exists is by your word. You spoke all into being. Uh, so you are worthy of glory as everything that is created, including those attendants around the throne, including the heavens itself, including that throne itself. Everything that has come into being comes by the existence of the power of God. Therefore, he is worthy of glory and honor and power. Wow when we, we think of what God has made. And then, secondly, not only uh, are they created by him, but for him. God has made all things for his good pleasure and, and uh, purpose. Um, for it says, Worthy are you, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and created. Uh, King James translates that and uh, for thy good pleasure, uh, they were existed and created. So he is worthy, for all of this belongs unto him. And all of this was to be used by him. So the conclusion is that uh, the introductory element as John's first glimpse into heaven uh, what is foundational to everything that comes after this is the throne. And to recognize that, that God is seated on his throne. So tonight, as we go home, <laughs> remember, God is on his throne. Uh, this world seems like a, a mess, uh, but uh, the very first thing that he sees and hears from this throne is uh, to look at all these things that must come to pass. Uh, it's going to be fulfilled. Uh, the covenant-keeping God is going to keep his word. And uh, we know how it ends. Uh, we have the book of Revelation. We know what God's purpose is. We know there's going to be a new heaven, new earth. And tonight, we can just go home and rejoice and give praise to our God. For he made all things. All things belong unto him. All things serve his purpose. We should submit our lives to him recognize the appropriateness of submitting it to him in all aspects. And that's part of our worship, of acknowledging uh, that he is worthy of the glory, the honor, the power. Um, no one greater or better to serve. No wiser God. No greater benefactor. Uh, may our worship be not just in word, but in action. And so there are actions associated with this this worship of God. It's not just that they're pronouncing these things, but they're bowing before him. They are casting their crowns. They are actively uh, submitting and uh, serving the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for the reality that you are the sovereign God who sits upon a throne. Uh, Lord, uh, you are a king like no other. Uh, your kingdom is like no other kingdom. Uh, it is unfathomable for us. Uh, but uh, may we understand to a degree the majesty, the beauty, the glory, and the sheer manifestation of, of power uh, that uh, even as the Queen of Sheba saw an earthly throne that was like no other because Solomon was given riches like no other earthly king. He was given wisdom like no other earthly king. He was given peace like no other earthly king. And so she saw a reign that was like no other earthly king. Oh Lord, there is no king like you. Nothing on earth can compare. Uh, you made all things. Uh, you have brought all things into existence. And all things exist for your purpose. 
your glory, your honor. Uh, so, Lord, help us, even as the Queen of Sheba gave praise to Solomon, recognized the goodness of God, and gave gifts. Uh, Lord, may we give ourselves, our monies, our efforts uh, to serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and may we understand what a privilege and joy it is to do so. Thank you for allowing us to be a part of your kingdom, not only today, but tomorrow and for all eternity, that we will have that privilege of being in your presence and uh, enjoy uh, your rule and the peace and the joy and the prosperity that comes to us as a result. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, and you are dismissed.